Pretty soon, the rock and roll recording area started to happen. This was the most productive and lucrative part of my New York career. I started with Atlantic Records, backing singers like Ruth Brown, The Platters, Ray Charles, Dinah Washington, Paul Anker, Neil Sedaka, The Oreos, Bobby Darin, The Tokens, Della Reese, The Cordettes, The Coasters, The Drifters, and almost every other artist that they had. Della Reese. <coughs> Along the way, I was involved with many big bands, trios, quartets, duets, and every other kind of music. Some of the people that I was worked with was Lucky Miller's big band, Boyd Rayburn's big band, Alan Freed's big band, rock and roll band, doing the uh, holiday shows at the Paramount Theater for three or four years. Uh, Duke Ellington, Cap Calloway. I worked with the All Apollo Theater House Band, Billy Taylor Trio, Pete Brown Quartet, Cecil Lloyd Duet. Cecil Lloyd was a wonderful piano player from the British West Indies from Barbados. And Billy Rowland was Perry Como's piano accompanist uh, for 25 years. I also worked with Red Allen duo and uh, Red Allen Septet and Johnny Hodges Octet and Stuff Smith's Quartet. In the 1960s, I approached several record companies to let me record some original compositions featuring the bass playing melodies with a choral group background. They all turned me down, telling me it's too far out. Well, I decided to have my own record date, and with the help of some of the musicians that worked with me during the background records on the, off all the companies, I, I, uh, they helped me and I wrote the charge and hired a studio and we went in and cut two sides. The musicians did the date for 40 bucks a piece and the studio gave me a break on the price. We pulled it off for under $500. We recorded two sides, one called Take Five and the other side called Trotting In. Ironically enough, Dave Brubeck came up with his Take Five at the same time. He being such a big star at the time, his Take Five knocked my Take Five right out of the box. Brunswick Record put my record out but did not promote it, so it really didn't get to be heard by many people. My wife bought seven of the copies and my daughter bought the other three. It sold about 10 copies. <laughs> I still am trying to get that record played to the public and uh, it is a classic and I still have hopes to get it to the public. The marriage between the bass sound and the voices background is a fantastic new sound, and it will be accepted with amazement at, and a, as a rare musical treatment never ever tried or heard before. Some of the ladies that I've worked with at one time or another, or played with you know, in concerts or something like that, uh, are, I'll give you some examples of how they are. They are the most fascinating people I ever met in my life. Starting off with Duke Ellington, he was one of the most relaxed, patient men I ever knew. To work with him was a privilege. Cab Calloway, as long as you did the job, you had a job. He was a cool cucumber. Benny Goodman, you told the mark or else perfection was tantamount to him. Count Basie, cool and relaxed and a swinger. His life was as rhythmic as his music. These are some of the bass players that I was involved with and were very good friends of. <clears throat> the first one was Oscar Pettiford. He liked my plan and he hired me to back him on bass when he adopted the cello as a lead instrument. I wrote a song called Oscar Lipso, which we recorded as a quartet. Guess who was on that record? Well, Duke Ellington was on piano, Billy Strayhorn was on Celeste, and Joe Jones was on drums, and I was on bass. The record is a very good success in selling now. Slam Stewart also took me under his wing 
when he heard me in a Boston nightclub and showed me how to improve my technique in playing with the bow. Chubby Jackson, who played with bass with Charlie Barnett, took a liking to me, and he gave me many pointers on how to improve my tone and bring my sound out on the bass. These bass players were the cream of the crop, and I was on it and quite thrilled to have their attention and, and their help. <clears throat> About the different styles of music, we'll start off with jazz. Jazz was by far the onset of modern music history of our times. It was the most exciting and inventive sound that thrilled the world. Dixieland was a part and party of jazz and the contribution to American music is a treasure to music lovers all over the world. And next we had swing. Swing was a treatment of music which lent itself to Saturday night dances, proms, and young people adopted swing in hordes. Bebop was an inventive style by Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, Miles Davis, and others who adopted that style of playing. It was highly technical, but not very melodic. You would have to be a musician to understand the riffs and the dis dissonances used by the player. It was commendable in its own way, however. It was called bebop because every phrase that they played in their solos ended with bebop, bebop, very. Now go to side two for the rest of my little talk here. <laughs> 